your uh, questions in the chat box. Also, uh, uh, as the evaluations come up, please respond to those and fill in the details there. Help us uh, improve this, uh, these webcasts and get you the information you're looking for. I'm going to start out with a few questions for Frank. Um, Frank, you presented some emissions charts and data that gave percentage of the total emissions. Uh, was that information uh, raw emissions or equilibrated for greenhouse or global warming impact? Uh, which slides are you referring to? The the few slides on uh, beef and and dairy animals. Yeah, I think the in general the question was in reference to in uh, earlier on you presented. Oh, oh yes, yes, yes. Okay, I think it is the slide on uh, with the pie chart and the one from USDA, and um, this slide the the bar graphs and the pie chart they are in uh, teragram CO2 equivalents. So when it says, for example, manure nitrous oxide 27%, uh, and it shows a certain portion of the pie chart, then that's expressed as uh, the CO2 equivalents. And um, so it's all converted into CO2 equivalents. Follow-up question, Frank. Uh, you uh, referred to Jude's presentation or a paper where she's yes. looking at uh, uh, the reduction in emissions uh, from dairy specifically, was that a reduction in emissions only on a per unit of production basis milk produced, or, or is that uh, accumulated over all the milk production in the national? It is a, a relative comparison. So basically looking at uh, reductions of emissions per unit of, of, of products, so per unit of milk in this case. So what it shows is that the more efficient you become, with your production system, uh, the smaller is your relative impact, environmental impact, in this case, the greenhouse gas impact. Uh, and that is just because uh, you basically um, use more of the energy that you feed to an animal for the production that comes out of it and, uh, and not the majority for maintenance. So that, that was a very important paper. There, there were two, one in Journal of Dairy Science and one in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. I, I strongly recommend uh, to read those. A question for yourself, or maybe Melissa can chime in. Uh, just in terms of poultry, why were, why was the production of nitrous oxide so much higher for poultry than for swine? Well, uh, that, that's just based on the total number of animals. Um, I believe this question is again uh, relating to this USDA chart, and um, it actually shows that the swine total greenhouse gas emissions are higher than the poultry, and, um, but this whole slide is not normalized uh, on a per livestock uh, unit, uh, but it is basically just the total population of livestock uh, across the different species, and so that's why this number is higher. Thank you, Frank. I have a couple other questions that I'll come back to you on. Uh, Melissa, uh, I saw you put the link to the table on the emissions um, in there or, or livestock numbers to exceed the emissions. I uh, appreciate that. I would refer everyone to that link that she put in the chat box. A uh, question came in as to why are monthly sampling manure samples required from uh, manure systems that would tend to have very stable manure? Mm -hmm. um, we've talked to a lot of different groups throughout the development of the rule and um, several within the livestock community wanted to, I guess, have a way to show that they've made changes in feed that could result in changes to manure management emissions. So, um, though I guess if diet were steady over the course of the year, the um, content would be also um, there's just an interest in reflecting changes. Question came in relative to the model that's used to, for your estimation of greenhouse gas emissions. Does that model account for ammonia effects on the nitrogen balance? Excuse me? A question came in relative to the model that mm -hmm. EPA is using to estimate the, uh, the number of animals that are required to exceed the threshold. Mm -hmm. uh, and also will be used after with the sampling. Uh, does that model account for the effects of ammonia on the total end balance? In the mm -hmm. 
for nitrous oxide? Right. The, um, the emissions estimates that the equations and models are getting at are just for the actual N2O emissions from the um, manure management system. So it's um, not looking at ammonia. It's trying to get just the final amount of N2O that's emitted. This question was for Frank, um, but um, if you want to chime in, Melissa, uh, feel free. Oh, why not just uh, monitor or regulate ammonia since nitrous oxide is uh, is involved, and we could we could assess it in that way. Well, the, this issue is very complex. Basically, um, it's not just a question of ammonia or nitrous oxide. It's a question of reactive nitrogen. Nitrogen can, can go many different routes, and um, in order to characterize what kind of route is taking, you really have to go a different route from the emission factor route, and that is the route of process-based models because you need to know what are the conditions that you find at a livestock operation that lend themselves to nitrogen going one path over the other. So it's not just a question of regulating ammonia and kind of coming up with a relative proportion of uh, how much nitrous oxide can, can um, come off that, that, um, that ammonia, but um, the question is really what are the conditions that exist on that dairy or poultry operation or feedlot or so, uh, because only then, only if you take that into consideration, you will be able to predict how much of the nitrogen will end up as nitrous oxide. So emission factors will not do it. They will not do the job, and just going through ammonia will not be the answer. Hey, Melissa, I saw you uh, responded to a question that came in, but uh, maybe you can elaborate on that a little bit more. If a, if a farm has a digester, uh, you referred to the fact that they only would be reporting if if the leakage from the digester mm -hmm. exceeded the threshold. Uh, you want to clarify that a little bit? Sure. Um, farms would sum emissions of methane and N2O from all of the system components at the farm. So um, a farm with a digester would... Um, for the digester component, just be looking at the methane that is either leaking from the digester itself or that's not combusted at the flare or energy project. But they would sum that methane that's escaped with methane and nitrous oxide from other sources at the site. Other sources in the manure management system, sorry, to be clear. I'm not specifically looking at the, uh, the table uh, that you referred to, but a question came in relative to swine and the numbers for the different um, types of operations, feral to finish, finishing, sow, sites, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, can you clarify uh, what sizes would be above the threshold for, for the different really? swine types of operations? Or, or is that laid out well in the table? Um, I'm going to pull up the table now and just make sure. Um, we have examples for several types of farms in the preamble text. Uh, to get a better idea, I would look at the technical support documents that are also online. The preamble lays out um, the highest emitting farm types, so, um, um, so people reading the role can get a rough idea if, um, if they have a farm under that number, it's unlikely that they'd have to report because the numbers in the table are just for the highest emitting types of farms, so you would need the lowest number per capita at your site. Sorry, so the lowest farm population because they're at these higher emitting farm types. I'm going to divert over to uh, Rich Grant while uh, a couple more questions come in. Uh, Rich, uh, you alluded to the land application, and, and it's not uh, reportable, but but what is the difference in greenhouse gas emissions from injected versus surface applied manure? Well, certainly, the the emissions from the injected you can essentially kill your emissions from the from the uh, land surface with injection, but uh, it depends partly on terms of what the weather conditions or the soil uh, moisture conditions are prior to and after the injection. 
Melissa, I'm going to generalize this question. Maybe you can respond specifically to the question on the chat box. But uh, for uh, operation, no matter what species it is, if they have some uh, some new or, or um, existing treatment facility, tre uh, processing um, and treatment of manure, uh, how are they going to be uh, covered? Is that going to be accounted for just from the manure samples? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? If I am a livestock operation and I'm doing something in terms of a treatment or processing uh, system, mm -hmm. and uh, it's not not a common system for treating and processing manure, uh, is that going to be, a, how is that going to be accounted for in the emissions estimate? Is mm -hmm. it just through the manure sample or, or what? Um, I suppose it would be just through the manure sample. Um, in the rule, we, I guess, can only ask for emissions to be reported from systems for which we have emission factors and guidance in the rule. So um, I suppose if the system wasn't considered to be one of those types, it may not fall under this requirement. If in reading the rule you think that perhaps it's incomplete and that there are other systems either in existence today or could potentially be around and might have significant emissions, that would be a really good comment to make. There are a variety of uh, the chat box is getting good use. That's excellent use of the chat box. People are responding to others' questions. Uh, here's a general question for you, Melissa. Once this uh, making the assumption that the proposed rule or some var variation of that will go into effect, what are what are the alternatives that might be down the road? Is there any discussion of that? Or are you at liberty to to mention what what's on the table? The alternatives for methodologies or um... well, the reporting is obviously phase one. Uh, what's what are the likely outcomes of a year or two of reporting? Um, well, the reporting rule is meant to be um, used to provide useful information for a whole range of different future climate policies. Um, it was written so that it was neutral to what kind of policy that might be, but it allowed us to collect data that might have a variety of uses under a variety of different policy scenarios. So. Um, it's impossible to say what that might be a year from now, but hopefully the data we're collecting is useful no matter what. Rich, can you uh, just give a, you've been responding to some of the N2O uh, questions that came in. Can you kind of summarize some of what you've, you've given those folks in terms of response, in terms of nitrous oxide, oxide measurements from lagoons and storages? We haven't actually begun measurements of the nitrous oxide from the lagoons. That, that'll be starting next month, um, so that we don't have any data uh, currently for that, uh, even to, to give you an idea of what the measurements are going to be. Have any of the speakers seen a, a question that they'd on the chat box that they'd like to elaborate on? Yeah, this is Frank Midlener. There's a question on the ANOVA and whether or not there uh, have been found to be uh, interferences, and uh, the answer is yes. Uh, there can be significant interferences. Uh, the ANOVA has six filters, and uh, just to give you an example, if you do not measure ammonia, if you don't have a filter for ammonia uh, in your ANOVA, but there is ammonia in, in, in the air that you measure, then uh, it can happen, and it has happened, that other gases that you measure will be inflated, will be higher, uh, and that the readings will be um, incorrect because the ammonia that's in the air can interfere <coughs> with other filters, for example, with methanol or ethanol filters. And so we have, uh, we have done a validation study on the ANOVA, and we have found that uh, one has to check very carefully which filters to use when buying this instrument. Otherwise, one can have uh, real issues with it. Yeah, thanks, Frank, for mentioning uh, ammonia. I forgot about that. Question came in about uh, health and performance of animals uh, in the presence of these greenhouse gases. Uh, I'll avoid um, providing my input until the speakers do. Uh, are there levels of methane 
and or uh, CO2 that uh, will impact animal performance? Can you repeat this, please, Richard? In terms of uh, if there's a buildup of greenhouse gases inside of a building, uh, CO2 or methane, uh, I'm rephrasing the question, what are the animal health or performance impacts of these gases? Are, are there any? Well, methane, methane and, and CO2 should not have um, health consequences in those uh, levels, at those levels that we find. Uh, nitrous oxide uh, won't have it because it's not in high enough concentrations. And if it were, well, nitrous oxide is laughing gas, and so that would be a funny picture, I guess. But, um, but nitrous oxide will never be at, at levels where it will affect the performance. I would just add that uh, ventilation system failures, obviously uh, CO2 buildup is related to uh, uh, a big problem with ventilation failures and what we see after that. And uh, explosiveness of contained methane obviously could be a problem, but it's not directly a health effect uh, in the sense we would think of with ammonia. Uh, quite a few questions on uh, measurement systems. Uh, I'm going to leave those to uh, the presenters to, to give. I have quarter to three, and we are, we are past our normal allotted time. Uh, so I am going to uh, bring this to a close, and we will try to look through the questions that came in and address those that we, don't, we may have missed. But I appreciate everybody attending. We had a very good uh, uh, turnout for the live webcast and remind your associates that this will be archived and available. And I just give uh, uh, kudos to our presenters for uh, helping us with this timely topic and, and we'll, we will turn it over until the June webcast. Thank you all.